Okay, uh, we've started the recording. Uh, welcome to the uh, CLM at WPI. We've got presenters uh, Say Longuardia and Carlos Silva from New Mexico State University today presenting their dynamic interactions in a dual crop setting. And we've got Saeed already up presenting the slides, so I'll go ahead and hand it over to him. Saeed, go ahead. Thank you very much, Tim. Can you mute the microphone there? Okay, thank you. So, um, so th first of all, I, I should note that this, this work is still in progress. We just started this about two months ago, but um, we kind of worked on that um, in, in our spare time, actually. But so the draft, actually, we wrote a draft paper based on our results and submitted this for uh, the conference of the Computational Social Science Society of the Americas. And, um, and we are seeking feedback on this work as we go forward. So uh, I've been working with Carlos Silva, who is also present here, so he can actually uh, weigh in when, when it's needed. So uh, I think I need to also give some background about our work. Um, our research is focused on the water energy nexus in the state of New Mexico. Um, water resources are limited here in, in the state, as you perhaps know. So there is a competition between um, different sectors uh, for water use. Agriculture is um, the biggest user as it, it consumes uh, about 90% of water here. Therefore, one part of our research is to understand how this sector consumes water. Uh, Carlos had this idea that interactions between um, upstream and downstream farmers could uh, kind of um, play a key role in understanding of the dynamics of agriculture sector and its water use in New Mexico. Uh, the main hypothesis was that upstream farmers' water consumption patterns impact crop selection of downstream farmers. Um, downstream farmers' crop selection in turn changes their water use patterns, which impacts the water resources, then dynamics of water resources ultimately feed back, feeds back to uh, the upstream farmer's decision-making processes. And this creates a set of uh, feedback loops that uh, may generate interesting dynamics. So we decided to develop a hypothetical model and see how it behaves under different circumstances. Um, so, in this presentation, uh, the feedbacks that we are looking for includes um, that, um, so first of all, other than the potentials that uh, we, we will discuss here about this model, um, our main question is that what other areas uh, we can explore with this model? So that is, I think, the main kind of question we have here for you folks. And the second thing is that what structures or feedback loops should we add or remove to make the model more interesting or more reasonable? So we also need feedback on the model structure. And the, the other question we have is about the literature. So this is a pretty new kind of um, work that we have started. So um, I personally am not very much familiar with the literature in this area. I know that Ali Seysel um, from Turkey has done some great um, ag water kind of modeling. Um, so I, I'm aware of his work. Uh, we also know about Slobodan Simonovic, uh, if I spell is, uh, if I pronounce his name correctly. Um, he has done some hydrology modeling with system dynamics. Benjamin Turner also has done some ag water kind of modeling here at Joe and uh, New Mexico State University uh, when he was working here. But uh, other than these works, um, we are not very much familiar if there's any 
interesting or significant work, um, we are looking actually to know about that, those works. And also, we have some terminology things that you want to brainstorm uh, that I will talk about later uh, in the, as presentation goes forward. Any questions so far? No questions so far. Just would like to welcome Brett and Fred to the discussion and, and go ahead. I think we'll pop in with the questions and, and feedback as you go along, but we'd like to see the model. Okay. <clears throat> so just feel free to stop me uh, if you have any question. So I, I, we would like to have kind of conversation instead of a presentation because actually uh, we are not prepared for a presentation, as you know. We Yesterday, we just decided to present in this, uh, in this uh, platform, so we haven't prepared any slides or anything, so I prefer to have a conversation instead of, you know, uh, just... Um... Well, let's, let's jump into a conversation then. I think some of the things you asked for is what can the model be used for? What is it currently used for? If you could describe, you describe what the model shows, but how is it currently used? Is it used just for hypothesis testing of sort of exploratory? What are the dynamics? Is it used for policy testing? What are the things it's currently used for? So, so we developed that. Can you mute that? Sorry. Oh, sorry. So we we currently use this to just explore this area to understand how um, you know different players interact in the system and how, actually not how they interact but how their interactions will uh, you know lead to interesting dynamics. So we um, basically what we want to know about this actually from this model is to understand what parts of this system is generates more interesting results and then focus on those things so that is basically the, to be short exploration so we are just want to explore this uh, you know area with a hypothetical model so that at least the general so, sense. two things i see coming from nevada um two things I see that you would have to decide with a model boundary. So first of all, I think doing this thing with a model, because you're kind of building this up as a hypothetical, having clear model boundaries is going to be interesting so you don't end up modeling the whole system. If you're focusing on farmers upstream and downstream, that could be a good way of creating a boundary that says connection to those. But two things I see right away is you have price and you have performance. In Nevada, they have water rights. And water rights is how water is distributed to farms and it's foot acre which means a foot high of water across a solid acre and that's a right you have like a right to land or a right to minerals or a right to do and the question is if you have price performance and water could you add a small sector that intersects with those not adding any other sectors and say the market structure of water rights and then do policy testing on that to see what dynamics that plays does it help does it hurt some of those water rights go back hundreds of years, others are put up for auction. So it creates a very interesting market dynamic where now water is no longer owned where it falls, it's owned by a right or a license. Um, but I don't know if New Mexico has water rights, so that may not be relevant. Yeah. The sec second yes. thing is, go ahead. Yes, we have water. I, I think uh, that will be uh, clearer if we go into the the structure of the model because we have that. Uh, I mean, we have water rights in New Mexico, and but we have uh, captured that with a very simple, you know, parameter that changes uh, the, you know, the water rights or allocation of water, um, upstream water, uh, surface water, uh, from the upstream to downstream. So, if we go to the details of the, the structure, I think um, we can we can. Uh, go forward with, the, with these kind of uh, discussions. So what is the second question? Uh, the second was simply, and you may again have this in the detail of destruction, how conservation efforts specifically targeted to farming affects these. Again, not trying to do conservation in a broad brush anywhere else, but within the context of this model, what, is, what role does conservation have in terms of surface water, groundwater, and the effect of farms? Can you put conservation efforts on a downstream farm that affects in theory, an upstream farm, the feedback loop tells me I should be able to conserve water in a downstream farm and it gets to an upstream farm. How does that work, or does it work? 
So that is that is included in the current model, but we haven't analyzed that yet. I will explain these things later, I think, as we go forward. So let me just, if, if there's no other uh, question or comments, I can show you uh, each module, how, how, so I can actually, I need to explain a little further about this model, but then we can go into the details. So first of all, the model that uh, we developed is published through IC system server at, uh, let me show you this, this link, if you see, this is the link. Um, if you go there, you can actually, this is publicly available, so you can go there and uh, play with the model and just, if you have any comments, uh, we will be happy to get those. Uh, there's no link showing. Say, did you type it into the oh. chat? Uh, I can see that on my screen. Do you see this now? Oh, no. Your screen went blank for us. Oh. Let me check. You, you may be sharing your screen and not your, share your whole, uh, you may have oh. been sharing just an application rather than full screen. I'm seeing an error. The presentation ended because the program was closed. The program was not closed. So let me just um, do it again. Share, present the program again. And then you will be Yeah, there's to... usually two options, share program or share entire like desktop screen. Yeah. To just share what, what, what I did was that I just uh, exit the full screen mode. So that's, that, hap that's, that has happened because of this, I think. So do you see the screen now? Yes. We we see your presentation. So you see the link here on the on the address bar of the explorer? No. No, it, it's it's actually a pretty small image, by the way. Sorry. So let me just I will pose I will uh, copy this and post it on the chat session. Where is the chat? Uh, chat window. Lower just find a little uh, speaker cloud and post it there. Mm, okay, I found it. I think. So, do you see the screen now? Yes, we got it. Okay, great. So, if you want to play with this model, you can easily go there. And do you see the model on the screen now? You, you, you closed out. You, you, you got to present that screen again or present your entire desktop. Oh, okay. okay. And while Saeed's doing that, we're going to take this link for those, and we're going to post it to the SD Lightium afterwards on Facebook so people can see that. And if you don't have that link, I'll put it up here just in a sec. It's a Facebook group for the WPI CLM. We're going to go ahead and post this link there, so capture it now. We'll put it up later. And if you don't have that Facebook group, I'll put it up right now while Saeed's bringing up the uh, model itself. Okay. So you should be able to see this, this model again now. Is it, does okay, it work now? We see your screen now. Okay, cool. So, so we do. Uh, so the, the the model is available there, um, and we will welcome actually any feedback or comments on that uh, through email. And now we have four endogenous modules on this uh, in this model. We have upstream farmers and downstream farmers and groundwater and also performance, which will be affected by the interactions of the players, but doesn't affect any other module. Um, we also have two exogenous uh, modules. Price is just there to test different scenarios, and also surface water is actually endogenous uh, by itself, but uh, what is exogenous about this module is the scenarios about precipitation, for example, drought, and these kind of things. So um, that is another model. So let's go to the upstream farms. In upstream farms, we have stock of farm. So total farm, total land available is constant, and it is normalized at one. Farmers can allocate this farm to only two crops. So this is a two crop system. We have crop one and crop two. So farmers allocate farms based on the uh, expected gain of water of each crop. Um, 
And um, so another thing is uh, that is very important here is farm adjustment time. So it is assumed that different crops have different adjustment time in terms of farm length. And that is because of their cultivation, you know, time span. Some crops have longer, uh, you know, cultivation time span compared to others. So um, if farmers start to cultivate or to, to uh, cultivate actually one, one crop, then they need to kind of wait until that crop um, yields and then they can replace. So on average, there is a difference between these two crops here. I, I can talk about that in the assumptions module when, when we show what is the detailed assumption of the model. So uh, quick question. Yes. Uh, so you'd, uh, I say you're using arrays. Um, yeah. Good idea. So is the stock in this case, the amount of acreage under cultivation for a particular crop? Exactly. Yes. All right. And um, the, the, the way that um, the diagram actually represents the structure could be kind of misleading. And there, there are some mathematical cons, uh, considerations that I had uh, to, you know, to consider because, because we wanted that the model finally be expanded uh, to, uh, from, you know, more types of crops. So it's a kind of complexity of the math behind this, but in general, the farm, uh, if, if we want to imagine for this two crop system, there is actually uh, two, there are two stocks that are connected. So the total amount of farm is always constant at one and the crops move uh, the farmland that is allocated to each crop moves from one stock to other. So if you want to increase one farmland, you need to decrease the other one. So, so is that an explicit adjustment or an implicit that you've got there an indicated farm change? Did you use a graphical function or just a uh, you know difference between the desired and actual? So the desired, can you mute the mic, please? Thank you. So the um, there is a there is a very simple uh, allocation pro uh, procedure here, which is expected gain of water. So we divide expected gain of water for each crop to total expected gains. So that gives us a ratio, and based on that ratio, uh, farmers adjust farmland. So, but expected farm expected gain here uh, of farm. Um, of water for each crop actually uh, is dependent on several factors. One is the price of each crop. So if one crop is more expensive, I mean, in the market, uh, that becomes, I mean, more that crop becomes more attractive, of course. But the more, the most important actually variable here is the gain of water because we are in an arid area uh, and water is scarce. So that is the most uh, important limiting factor for the farmers. So gain of water is an important player for the expected gain of water. And, um, and that depends on water intensity of crops, how much water this crop uses, land productivity and uh, price of, price of uh, the crop. Uh, farmers could be also sensitive to risk. For in the default model, this um, multiplier is actually zero, so people are not actually sensitive to the risk, but we test what happens if, if they become uh, risk averse, and we can actually test different levels of risk aversion. So, uh, uh, quick yes. question. Um, based on what you just said, it sounds like the, uh, <clears throat> the stocks in the um, diagram you're just showing are actually decomposing by the type of crop as opposed to the spatial area that it occupies, correct? So in uh, other words, I mean, there, is, are, there, there are as many stocks as there are unique um, crop types. Is that right? So the, mm, there are only two stocks here. 
for this for this particular model the way the, the reason that we used arrays here is that we wanted to in the future to expand the model to further number of crops to more crops so then so then we could easily increase the number of you know subscripts here right right but for this one there is only two stocks so it, that's what I actually tried to say. Uh, there are there are two stocks. One is for crop one, another is for crop two, and okay. that indicates the farmland that is allocated to each crop. Right. In terms okay. of acres, so the unit of measure is acres here. Okay. So, okay. So the flows then are increasing or decreasing acreage for a yes. particular crop. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. Okay. Thanks. So water intensity of crops depends on several factors. Um, it depends on how, so what, mainly it, it depends on, so on the, uh, at the initial level or in, in the normal state or equilibrium state, uh, water intensity is constant for each crop. But as groundwater declines, so, so you know, and initially, uh, surface water is adequate for for both, you know, upstream and downstream farmers. But in some situation where uh, surface water is not adequate for the, you know, irrigation, then farmers try to pump the groundwater. As they pump the groundwater, the level of groundwater declines, and as the level of groundwater declines, salinity of groundwater increases. So, and crops are sensitive to salinity, and this sensitivity could be different for different crops. But what happens is that then we need more and more groundwater to to you know to irrigate them because of the salinity level. So that's that is so water intensity is mainly coming from this variable, and then water demand. Uh, groundwater demand compared to the total water demand for each crop determines how how much that salinity affects uh, water intensity. So water demand is also um, a function of the level of farms for each crop and also for the intensity of crops for each crop and then Based on the water demand, we can decide how much water should go, um, how much surface water should go for each crop. Farmers actually, in this model, farmers can decide um, how much of the irrigation demand for each crop should be met by the you know, surface water and what fraction of the demand should be uh, satisfied with the groundwater. So in, in the cases that groundwater is saline, then farmers may decide that um, to, to irrigate actually a crop that is more sensitive to groundwater salinity uh, with the surface water, because then they can actually in, um, kind of optimize their yield for each crop. This seems to be, I'm very interested in the groundwater because I'm interested in the carrying capacity, but in this slide, it seems to be that farmers are making very rational decisions with no past effects of like anchor of their memories. Is that just intentional to keep it simple that there's no sort of what was the average behavior of the system in the past influencing the keep doing what they were doing or react the same way as last time? So uh, first of all, this this particular do you do you see the uh, the most coarser my most coarser here or not? Uh, yeah, we can see it on the screen. Yep. Yep. Okay, so this variable, surface water fraction allocated to each crop, is actually so with this one. It is just an example to your for your question. This is not a general um, no, answer. But for this example, uh, farmers do not make the optimal decision. They just allocate relatively. I mean, they allocate more water to to a crop. That is kind of more sensitive to, you know, to uh, groundwater salinity. So in in reality, or in in some extreme cases, that farmers are too rational or are, uh, perfectly rational, they may actually follow kind of binary decision making, where 
the for, you know the when when a, the crop is more sensitive to uh, groundwater salinity will be exclusively irrigated by surface water and the rest should go to the you know um, I mean the rest of the demand then will be satisfied by the groundwater but in, in this case they do not do that so the decision of the farmers are kind of rational but they are not perfectly rational so I can per so perhaps you can say that they are bound they have bounded rationality here so um, it's also is true for perceived water intensity. So uh, farmers' demand for irrigation comes with a delay. So they don't see the exact number of water intensity. So that comes with a delay. So perhaps you can play with these functions later to make them more precise. But this is just your draft of the model. I think that delay works pretty well. That 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 smooth is. I assume it's like a smooth or something. Yes. The smooth is, that, that's what I was looking for. The smooth stock is pretty much good enough for me. Like an average smooth is, is what I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, question here is, is water priced as well as the crop? Sorry, what was the question? It is, is there a price associated with water as well as the crop? Uh, no, uh, but, but um, shortage of water is kind of play that that price mechanism um, the role of that price mechanism it is assumed that um, as so it is a ma actually most important decision factor in, in farmers allo uh, resource allocation here but that depends so as water becomes more and more scarce uh, farmers go towards the, the you know the crops that's that are less sensitive to water or less water intensive. So the price mechanism is implicitly there, but there is no uh, explicit um, price mechanism for, for water systems. What, I don't want to delay you from getting the rest of the model, but what is the time boundary of this model? Is it measured in years, decades, uh, months? So the simulation period is 40 years. So, um, I think we are done with the upstream farms. So the downstream farms is exactly similar to, to this with some small differences. For example, for the surf, surface water with uh, inflow, that is not actually captured in this figure, um, they, they don't have, so the difference between upstream and downstream farms is that upstream farms have uh, immediate and first-hand access to to the surface to inflow of surface water. Downstream farms have 20% of water rights for the for the surface water that goes down. So, the, uh, upstream farmers cannot consume 100% of the you know stream of surface water. 20% of the water must go down, uh, but we can change that fraction to test different scenarios or different situations. So that is, I mean, available for players to, to you know, to select whatever water right they want to, to, to assume. So downstream uh, farms have, so should wait and, you know, see how much of the water is consumed but, uh, up by upstream farms. And the remaining water, surface water, will, avail will be available for them to use. If that is enough for their irrigation needs, then that's fine. Otherwise, they try to pump the groundwater. Opposite farmers also have that um, available. I mean, they could also pump the groundwater as well if they need it. So, so I don't show the downstream farms because that is similar to that. For the groundwater, groundwater is a very simple stock of water. Uh, we have uh, groundwater withdrawal, which is, as I just explained, uh, as downstream farmers uh, start to uh, pump it, then that declines, but there is a first uh, order control that actually controls the, this uh, outflow. There is a recharge system, uh, which some part of the surface water and also irrigation, actually, from um, farmers can go back as a recharge to the groundwater system 
So we have we can see the recharge from irrigation and re, um, natural recharge from the surface water flow. So this is a very simple. Um, so you. Yes. I was actually going to ask this. I was going to ask what kind of slack system you use: recharge, regeneration, replenishment. For those on that, we've got ten folks now on the call. Can you go through why you chose a recharge regeneration system versus one of the other kind of slack replenishment systems? Just for folks who may be less familiar with this kind of slack system. Uh, I don't. I'm not familiar, so I'm. I I'm not a hydrologist, so I don't know what are the other forms of the recharge systems. I don't know about that, but. Uh, from the models that I've seen here that people developed here in at MSU, uh, I understood that this is kind of the most, the simplest uh, kind of form of, you know, representing the groundwater system and recharge system. I don't know about the slack system. I, I have no idea what that is. So if Carlos has any answer with this question, he would be happy. Yeah, so uh, right now we use the this natural recharge here just to, in order to keep the simplicity. That's that's pretty much kind of where we're going for here. So keep it simple. We we could put a lot of other connections here between this recharge, recharge irrigation, and how all the new technology would impact this recharge irrigation. But we just want to keep it simple. We're just gonna assume most of the recharge here will be natural recharge. And a little bit of the recharge from irrigation. Okay. I'll answer your other question, Tim. Is, is there no uh, sort of envi is there no environmental uh, recharging from uh, rainfall or anything? That that would be that would be pretty much there, right? So uh, rainfall precipitation is actually uh, exogenous, and that is in the surface water module. So that goes to the surface water. And the surface water, if that increases, uh, the recharge also increases. But there is also a limiting factor here. So I cannot actually double click on this to show you the diagram. But uh, as the groundwater increases, the recharge rate declines because it's kind of a stock. If it is full, you cannot get more recharge. So there is also control here. But as if, if the groundwater depletes, then we will have more you know space for new recharge and then that depends on the downstream flow and upstream flow flow of you know um surface water which is coming from precipitation and rainfall mainly so does that answer your question fred yeah i think so i was also wondering i think in again i'm i'm not a soil mechanics guy so <clears throat> in uh, in drought conditions I think uh, the recharge rate would probably fall just because, you know, you don't have the um, sort of the already saturated pathways for surface water to transport to um, to the aquifer. So okay. I just, I, in, in, uh, these are all sort of exogenous things, I guess, you know, in terms of environmental effects like drought versus um, heavy rainfall. Yes, that is correct. So we have simplified all these effects into one single uh, parameter which is um, the sur surface water inflow that includes our sorts of you know inflow to the system and we can play with that as a kind of you know uh, drought scenario mm -hmm. for different situations so that is part of the scenario analysis um, as we can talk about that later uh, this is this is what I originally asked I was actually talking about the system dynamics reason um, one of the reasons, and this may be why they chose in the first place, uh, for those on the call, a slack with replenishment, if this were a flat flow, it, uh, those systems, those models can never break equilibrium. If it is a slack with recharge, oh, as what Saeed is modeled here, that is the only way you can break an equilibrium with an overshoot and collapse scenario, is to have a slack with recharge rate, which is... I'm no hydrologist at all either, but I was going to ask this and look at it, and it looks like this and what was modeled, at least at some point, because it allows an overshoot and a collapse scenario that breaks equilibrium versus a straight replenishment. So, I guess what you are referring to is that, I mean, what hydrologists here, if I'm not wrong, uh, refer to as kind of water balance. They try to keep the water balance always 
at kind of imaginary zero level. I don't know if that's what you are referring to or not. And if that's the case, it, they, they do it because they are interested in some kind of different uh, uh, dynamics. But the level it, of ground it, water it, is very important. Yeah, it wasn't even domain specific. This is just something that is uh, all system dynamic models. The, the structure here with this recharge rate, and you can't see my cursor because I don't have the screen, but the recharge rate in the middle makes it very difficult to maintain an equilibrium with the recharge, I think, it, versus if these were straight replenishments that were constant rates versus having uh, the recharge rate. At least when I when we were, when uh, Professor said and you were talking about other sources, I can put them up here. He was talking about replenishment systems and groundwaters were some of them. Flows that were constant and didn't have uh, that the replenishment was sort of a constant source. It was very difficult for a population to break its final equilibrium and sort of do that overshoot and collapse. That would actually break the equilibrium because it. But if there was a recharge rate with this sort of nonlinear effect here in the middle. That was a system that could generate an equilibrium breaking behavior under certain conditions because it has that lag and that nonlinear effect. So I'd be interested in seeing if you have those dynamics where the population can significantly outgrow the resources and then really drop it uh, quite suddenly. So that's, that's the, the comment is solely on model structure, not specifics to water or anything like that. Yeah, I think we have, we have those structures here. Because that is the main actual point here. We wanted to see how farmers interact with the hydrology system and how they feed back into the system and get, receive feedback from that system. So let me go back and just go to the assumptions. So these are let me restore everything here. So these are the basic assumptions of the model. So we have two different crops. As I described, these crops have different cultivation lifespan. Uh, it is assumed that crop one has a kind of shorter lifespan, so it is easier to adjust. So if farmers decide to remove that or reallocate that farm to other crop, it would be easier. I mean, it will be, uh, they, they need to wait shorter for that compared to the other crop which has a longer time span, so it is more difficult for them to reduce um, the farm that is allocated to this particular crop to allocate to the other in, in average. So uh, the other thing is that uh, crop one is less water intensive compared to the crop two. Crop two consumes more water uh, for, the, for the same amount of, you know, uh, cropland, uh, if we compare them, crop two and consumes more. And uh, at the same time, crop one is less sensitive to salinity of groundwater. So if groundwater is saline, then crop two becomes more affected compared to crop one. So, however, Crop two is more expensive in the market, so there is an incentive for farmers to go with the crop that is that consumes more water compared to the other because it is uh, more expensive or high, high at actually price at a higher level. So that is yeah. Easier. By the yes. by the way, that's what you just described is the problem with. Um... Uh, farmers growing almonds in California. Mm -hmm. They're they're big water hogs, but um, there's uh, a lot of farmers that are converting cropland to almonds because the price supports it. Mm -hmm. But they're uh, creating havoc now in the water supply. Yes, so I think the same situation is here in New Mexico. I, I think Carlos can explain that better. But we have also cotton and pecan as a kind of competing. Um, Right. crops here that have this kind of similar, you know, uh, characteristics compared comparatively. So uh, scenarios that we have here, we have a lot of them here, but we focus only mainly on the price volatility. On for, for this study, we we have plans to do more in the future, but so far we have 
focused on mainly on the uh, crop volatility of uh, the price volatility of crops. So we also have drought scenarios here. So we have different kind of uh, scenarios that we can play with that. Also here we have um, effect of um, you know technology on different crops for different farms, farm uh, upstream farms and downstream farms. We also have risk aversion scenarios here. As I described earlier, um, for the default scenario, um, risk aversions of farmers are zero. It means that for the default scenario, people or farmers do not react to um, price volatility or instability in the markets. But we can test uh, the behavior of the model um, you know, against risk aversion, what happens if, if they are risk aversion. We also can play with the water rights. So currently uh, we have 20% of water rights for downstream farmers, but we can play with that as well. So if you run the model with, with the base case, we can see that the model is in equilibrium. Everything is constant here. So now we want to see what happens if, um, for example, crop one, so the numbers in the brackets represent the type of crop. So one represents crop one and two represents crop two. So we want to see what happens if we have volatility in the price of crop one. If we run the model, you can see the price, the price of crop one here, which is very irregular. However, the mean value of this normal distribution is zero, so it stays at its normal price, but it is volatile. So the standard deviation is 20% here. So uh, what happens is very interesting. Uh, the results show this. Let me just mute my cell phone. So the results show that uh, if price price of crop one is volatile, uh, downstream farmers go or move towards the crop that is, let me just explain that later, but they move to, towards crop two. So this diagram shows the downstream farm land for crop one if you remember, the crop land was equal to one, and so we have here about here about 60% of farmland go for crop one. It means that the rest of the crop land, which is about 40%, goes to crop two. So here we show only uh, the farmland for crop one, but you can easily calculate the farmland for crop two. So if this declines, it means that for crop one, it means that the formula for crop two is increasing. So, so that is interesting because volat price volatility, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, the mean of the price is still the same. The only change here is, um, you know, the variation in prices. So if we have a kind of linear thinking, our conclusion perhaps would be that, okay, sometimes people, I mean, farmers uh, cultivate more of crop one and sometimes they have more, uh, more of crop one and sometimes they have less of crop one. So in general, the average must remain at the same level. But in reality, it doesn't happen. In reality, systematically, farmers go towards crop two. And if we go to upstream farms, upstream farmers also do the same, show the same behavior. They, they go to the crop too. And the reason here is a phenomenon that we call um, as, you know, crop stickiness. The thing is that crop two has a longer time adjustment than crop one. So, a sudden, for example, or kind of temporary increase in relative price of crop two leads farmers to, you know, to switch a little to crop two. But once they switch to that, they need to stick with it because it has a very long, you know, cultivation time span. It has 10 years of uh, 
called the Bayesian time span. So it is not uh, economically viable for them to just get rid of that crop in the middle of you know, the cultivation uh, life. So, so I'm going to ask something that I was challenged on my models. Is this just depicting that a pack dependent system irregardless of everything else? That basically once it yes. kicks off one way, it's stuck that way. And is there anything you can add that would force it to go back the other way? That could within endogenously in the model, you can create a scenario that realistically the farmers reverse their choice and go back, or is it purely path dependent? It is. It is very difficult for them. Can you mute the mic, please? Uh, it is very difficult for them to go back because, as I described, once they they start the cultivation, it makes more sense for them to wait until that crop yields. But you know, so yeah, that that's. Path dependence, I think, is there, and they, they need to stick with the crop as they move forward. So, uh, and that has also other implications here. For example, but well, I could, know, well, yes. one quick thing: could you even just add an exogenous, like government subsidy, that's purely exogenous to overcome that? That under certain scenarios, yeah, that of can break the path. I, I will show the. I will show that. Yes, yes, there are some situations. Great. So actually, I can show you this now, but let me before that explain uh, the other uh, implications of that. Another interesting thing is that price volatility itself could be a reason for depletion of groundwater. And that is a very interesting result that uh, we have. Again, this is not um, a step rise or decline of price. There is no um change in the mean value of price there, there is only you know a variation in the price level so that that is i think interesting um here we can see that average total revenue of farmers total i mean wealth of the society increases because of this behavior uh, the reason is that now people have moved more towards crop two and crop two is more expensive but this is not uh, costless the cost of this behavior is depletion of groundwater as I described so there is a kind of environmental cost for this improvement in the economy of the system so and the other interesting thing is that it doesn't matter which price is volatile if we reduce this to zero and increase the other price volatility and run the model again, we can see that the behavior is more or less the same. Now we can see that the price, uh, price of crop two is more volatile here. Downstream, the farmers still go towards more towards crop two. Average total revenue is still higher. Here. What's the sensitivity of the initial conditions to kick off this path dependence? Are there conditions minus an exogenous output? Where they it has, it is, the interesting thing is it is a very insensitive to initial setting unless you change um, you change the um, so the only sensitive point is the uh, crop adjustment time or uh, cultivation you know uh, lifespan which it makes sense right because this is the exact uh, exactly the reason that this is happening so if you change that then I mean it doesn't matter what whatever, whatever whichever crop that is uh, that has longer time span life uh, span then that becomes the, the a sticky crop we call it a sticky crop so farmers stick to that if if the price if the market is um, you know in a stable so um, that is now to, back to your previous question if Farmers are um, very, so let me just restore everything, run the model in equilibrium, and have price volatility, I think, of crop two. I am not sure if this is the one. So let me run this. And now, this is the basically the same behavior, right? Now, if farmers are risk averse, what happens? is actually we can see that that offsets the price stickiness effect if if 
farmers are risk adverse, then they avoid crop two, kind of, because crop two is more volatile than crop one. And that effect, that's actually uh, this uh, risk aversion offsets this crop stickiness. Of course, different levels of you know risk aversion have different levels. So, for example, if they are not that, I mean, they are risk averse, but not as um, as much as you know the previous case, then this will be the behavior which is kind of exactly offsets the you know a crop stickiness effect so that breaks that you know path dependence behavior that you were talking about is this well is this and, and i understand this is an early model so this may be something to look at when you're looking at additional sectors is there anything that i mean is this modeling really modeling risk aversion and crop longevity or, or time to mature and water is just a factor that kicks off that risk that makes them make the choice between which crop to plant. So, uh, the ultimate, the, the original goal was not to address these issues, I think, initially, but these were, these were the kind of behavior, uh, interesting behavior that we got from the model. So we tried to focus on these areas because these were very interesting behavior. We have also interesting behavior in other areas, but we, we need more analysis for them before talking about those things. But we we had very extensive, you know, uh, analysis on these parts. So we uh, decided to, you know, to start with these results first, but, but we can go and talk about or focus on different issues as we go forward. This, I think this model has a lot of potential to consider different issues, for example, technological impact uh, on the uh, behavior of the farmers and also, for example, social impacts, how, how different water rights or system of water rights could impact the system, etc. So, Yeah, um, one quick comment. I think this would be uh, even more useful as a policy tool if you would uh, introduce a fairly basic uh, commodity price dynamics model so that you're actually working with real interest rates um, in terms of projecting the simulation of the commodity price because if you're looking at if you compare strategies over many years you want to do that in terms of present value so mm -hmm. you're going to simulate the commodity prices with a, a particular interest rate structure over time mm -hmm. And uh, and the you know the 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 present value of a strategy is going to be you know all the future discounted cash flows from that strategy out to whatever your horizon is. So oh, if you want to yeah. if you want to com compare strategies, um, you want to do that in present value terms. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you would consider that. And I think sort of going along that point, but putting it more in system structure terms. I think you've got what it looks like is a you know like a second order major negative feedback loop on that that crop switching so it'll oscillate and just kind of go in a direction. There may just be a small balancing loop that helps it flip so that the farmers can go back and forth between the crops. And maybe that's a commodity pricing, maybe that's something else. There is there may just be some small little thing that helps them decide to go back to the crops. So and I see there's an oscillation, but something that significantly moves them back to over that equilibrium line so that it creates a little bit more, because I don't know if it's realistic that all the farmers do one thing and stay that way, but that may be that commodity structure. It may be a simple commodity so, structure. It may be something else, like an insurance structure. The farmers, I can actually, if I go back to the farmers mechanism here, um, so we can go back to different crops based on the first of all price of the crops and also water intensity of the crops. So, so they can see or the, the actually um, the dynamics. They can observe the dynamics of the market and also the agricultural system and also the hydrology system, and react to that and adjust their uh, decisions based on. If there are if there are any other mechanisms that 
actual or the real farmers take into account. For example, uh, Fred says that uh, we perhaps may uh, we perhaps need to uh, consider the kind of a net present value of uh, for uh, the crops. However, in this in this model here, uh, the farmers they kind of do that, Fred. Uh, the, uh, the the function that we have used in the expected gain of water is the forecast fu uh, built-in function in I think so what they do is actually they, they look at the previous trend of the uh, prices and all other kind of things and then try to forecast the trend for the next five years I, I believe mm -hmm. so they kind of try to us take the dynamics of the market into account, but mm -hmm. it is they are not, I think, uh, optimizing that based on net present value. But it right. is kind of similar to that, not precise. So, but in the future, it would be interesting to see how the system behaves under different assumptions. What happens, for example, if farmers are trying to optimize their uh, the net present value? If if that changes the behavior. So I think that would be an interesting right. area to explore. I'll, yeah, I'll, but... I'll talk offline site about because I, seeing this, I see the structure I was thinking about. I'll, I'll ping you offline about quick because we're running out of time. If there are any other questions that Saeed has, he's got a couple minutes left. It's a great presentation. Any questions from folks online? To I think one. Or... I think what you haven't addressed so far is the literature, which is also very important for us. Is there any vision? You know the Sandia National Laboratories, and I assume you do, but if you haven't, have you you've seen their work? Okay. I think um, so, yeah, Vince Tidwell has done some hydrology work uh, yeah. modeling here, so I have looked at them. But uh, what we are missing, I think, here is uh, the kind of works that connect hydrology to uh, uh, farmers' decision-making decision processes. There, there's, there were some in the conference last year, but they were very uh, rudimentary. They were based, um, actually, Babak had a fairly decent one, I believe, in Iran that he presented in the colloquium. But again, that he. Um, that was high, high, high low, low, low. Low. Okay. The ones I'm thinking from the conference were in Egypt related to how a dam placement would affect hydrology and farming decisions. But I don't think the modeling was at the level you're at now. I can go back and take a look, but I don't know any like domain specific experts. Thank you. Yeah. I would also suggest you look at the papers that have been done on um, hog hog price commodity dynamics. Okay. Uh, I think there's some ideas you could borrow from the way they've treated commodity market uh, modeling. Actually, Fred, I would suggest instead they look at the oil commodities one because the hog price has a breeding dynamic in there where you're breeding your commodity, whereas the oil has an infrastructure. And I think the farm would be more appropriate for the infrastructure dynamic. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Except that crops also have a gestation period, so. I mean, yeah, uh, that's a good point. That's maybe both uh, of them. Look at both of them. Yeah, and uh, and also if uh, you might want to look at any restrictions or incentives around uh, crop rotation. Um, I don't know if they have restrictions on that, but uh, you know there may be um, there may be uh, you know soil mechanics reasons for what you're limited to in terms of the rate of crop rotation. Yeah, I want to open it up to anyone out there in internet land. We've got 11 participants now. I think, um, I think Jim wrote something. Uh, I saw some notifications, but I don't know where I should click now. It's so complex. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see a message other than your posting of the link. And uh, I think uh, Tim must have posted the uh, SDLICM thing. Okay. okay. If you have quite, if you if you think of literature later, folks, post it on that Facebook group. I'll go ahead and post a reminder up. I see people yeah. about themselves. Said, do you want to close out while we, so oh, we end this up? Thank you so much, everybody, for your comments and for your time. It was very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Nice work. work. Stay in touch. Thank you. Great work, Said, and uh, we'll go ahead and post this link on the SD Lycan so people people can play with this model, correct? They can go online and play with it and work on it themselves. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you, you too. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to end the recording.